Hi guys, Eddie from The Desk here in London. Uh, obviously we're going to be talking about the coronavirus. Uh, it's pretty uh, dominant in news headlines at the moment. You can't get away from it and it is a serious issue. And first of all, before we kind of kick off this video, I just want to say Amplify R, uh, looking at this virus very, uh, you know, w with uh, concerned eyes. And we are sending our prayers to anyone who is you know, impacted by this and we are watching this. And um, yeah, we are taking this issue seriously. So before I start this video, uh, I just wanted to say that first. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about the end of the bull market today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video last week. Uh, I've got some really good feedback and really positive comments. So thank you all for tuning in uh, and leaving your comments. Definitely leave your comments down in this video. Uh, if you enjoy anything, if you want any video recommendations, um, if you want me to look at a particular thing, I do listen to the feedback. Um, so a few comments I took into account um, from the last video, I'm now covering in this video. So definitely uh, make sure you like, uh, you like this video, comment, uh, and definitely subscribe to the channel. Uh, I know a lot of you are actually watching this and you're not subscribed, so definitely, definitely uh, subscribe to this channel if you don't want to miss any market moving uh, videos or uh, market moving events that we cover on the videos. Um, you know, this can be the all important difference. So definitely make sure you're subscribed to this channel. Um, so today we're going to be covering the year to date performance of the different asset classes uh, and taking a look at 2019. Um, so it feels like a long time ago now, 2019. Um, this, this kind of end of bull market call uh, comes really from Goldman Sachs uh, and some major other US banks. Um, so we're, you know, uh, we're going to be analyzing all the different indicators and is this really the end of a 11 year bull market? We're going to take a look at some of the factors today. Uh, we're going to look at the global central bank policy and their actions. Um, so we had Christine Lagarde of the ECB and the Federal Reserve yesterday, um, you know, uh, issuing their policy actions. Um, we're going to take a look at the credit markets uh, and some potential falling angels that I'm going to discuss later. And I'm sure, uh, unfortunately, a lot of you have been hurt um, by some of the market moves. Uh, I think everyone has. Um, I saw um, H2O Asset Management uh, one of the firms in the city lost 30% of their, uh, well, 30% on Monday. Um, so these professionals are losing, uh, you know, considerable amounts of money as well. Um, so really the point of this video uh, at the end is going to be what to do next. Um, you know, is it time to sell? Uh, is it time to reevaluate? But I'm not going to give you financial advice. I'm not your financial advisor, um, but I'm just going to give you some indicators to look at um, from a portfolio management uh, approach. So this is uh, reached pandemic status now. I think it's pretty obvious um, that it has been. Uh, I think, they, but this is now the official statement um, from uh, the WHO, obviously the World Health Organization. But again, I just want to, uh, you know, it, edge on the uh, era of caution is, you know, 130,000 people have got this, but 70,000 have recovered. Uh, and this is a serious issue from the spread of the virus. Um, but the mortality rate, again, uh, is not as bad as, you know, people, uh, you know, I think are making out to be. And it's very hard to get away from when you see all this panic buying, um, you know, all the financial markets down. Um, it's always on the news. I think people just need to calm down somewhat um, to get away from this kind of sensationalist stuff that they're putting out in the media. It is a serious issue, um, but the mortality rate is over 60% in terms of, sorry, recoveries are over 60% of people that get infected. Um, I am very concerned um, about the, our health system, um, particularly the elderly that are the most vulnerable. I am very concerned about that. My mum actually works for the NHS and I know that they have been under huge stress anyway. Um, so this kind of influx of coronavirus is gonna be you know, extremely uh, damaging to them. And it's, I think it's worth noting uh, how well all of the health professionals in this country uh, are doing on the front line, you know, not afraid to get infected just to help people. So uh, I think that's worth noting as well. The S&P daily performance, um, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, even the big fang names now are down uh, you know, a lot. This is a bloodbath of red. Um, obviously the energy names being hit uh, extremely badly, but also financials now. Um, Boeing, again, down a huge amount. Uh, all the airlines, cruise liners, and there's, there's talk about bailouts for the, um, for the cruise liners and airlines that now at the moment coming from uh, America, which is completely shocking. Um, and I think all in the good times, all these companies have been levering up, taking all this cheap money. Uh, and now I think it's uh, kind of echoes the financial crisis where now in the good times, you know, they do very well. Um, but when, you know, the bad times come and viruses expose uh, weaknesses in the, uh, in the in the markets and with companies specifically, 
you know, they expect to be bailed out. Um, so we'll obviously wait and see and watch that situation. Um, but there, there is talk of that at the moment. Uh, the financials have been down quite, uh, quite largely recently as well. The year to date performance. Um, so still, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, they are reasonably flat on the year. Um, but the, obviously the energy names again, the financials, JP Morgan down 31%, Bank of America, down 35 percent there's there will be opportunities uh in these names for sure um i think there is my view is bearish uh for all all banks at the moment uh, from the video uh that i recorded last week so if you haven't watched that uh check the link in description i'll, I'll put that there um so jp morgan bank of america if you if you want to see uh, i know i talked about some of the stocks that i'm watching uh, in the last video um but if you want to see some of the levels that i'm looking at definitely uh, comment down below and that can be a, f a future video of some really attractive levels for the long term uh, that i'm looking at for uh, you know the fangs some of the banks and some other stocks that i'm looking at 2019 feels like a long time ago 2020 was meant to be the year of the election so donald trump uh, facing the, the presidential election. It's definitely now the year of the virus. Global growth expectations have been impacted very severely. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, earnings were meant to be you know, improving. Uh, I think EM was meant to be you know, the trade this year. Now that's turned into a huge pain trade. We had the resolution of the trade war. Um, the phase one deal was signed. And this is obviously going to be a, uh, a big boost for the economy globally and different, different countries. Um, but now, and that, that's one of the biggest worries, I think, when people were heading into the year, they were you know, reasonably optimistic as a result of that phase one deal. Um, and I think people will be light on their hedging. Uh, and as a result, like you saw, the biggest asset class performance last year, crude oil up 34%, the best performing asset. Um, the crude oil was down 30% you know, last Monday, right? So that just shows you how many gains from 2019 have just been completely wiped out us stocks up 31 percent small caps are getting hit hugely the, the small to medium uh size enterprises like the Rus russell 2000 in the us getting hit you know uh canadian stocks have you know even fallen below that 2018 sell-off that we saw uh you know across all uh equity indices fear is driving financial markets. So this is a fear and greed in index coming from CNN. And you can see, and I, really what I want you to focus on uh, is this one month ago that greed was driving financial markets. So that's how people were positioned uh, in their portfolios, in their kind of uh, short, shorter term positions, their more tactical plays. Now, extreme fear, extreme fear one week ago. So fear is definitely, definitely driving financial markets. And you see this um, with the panic, panic buying and stuff in supermarkets that you see all over social media. Bitcoin falls out of bed. Uh, this is kind of addressing a comment I saw in the previous video. And thanks for that comment. Um, I thought Bitcoin was meant to be the safe haven, this digital gold. It, you know, there's been a crypto route. I think, well, everything's been falling. Uh, I think there's almost nowhere to hide at the moment. Um, but you know, Bitcoin was down 20% today. And this is not an asset class we trade or analyze it um, at Amplify. Um, but I saw this and God, uh, down 20% in one day. So if you look, if you liked Bitcoin at 8,000, you're gonna like it a lot more uh, at 6,000 if you are a crypto trader or investor. And so does gold. So gold fell out of bed yesterday as well. And gold is meant to be the safe haven asset that's done extremely well uh, over the last 18 months, really. Um, but it was down, 3% yesterday and this you know huge move just in a couple of minutes i think uh, the the thought from the desk was that someone basically dumped 16 billion uh, in nominal terms of gold and i think it was 100,000 contracts uh, futures contracts of gold um, and the price just saw this wicked move uh, downwards so really there is almost nowhere to hide uh, at the moment the FTSE, we can't go uh, without talking about this. FTSE was down 10% and this was the biggest drawdown um, since 1987. Uh, the German DAX was down around 13%. The FTSE MIB uh, in Italy was down about 17% as well. All the European indices were down huge du double digits. Deutsche Bank was down 18%. Uh, I saw they have had a bit of a rebound this morning. So I can see the FTSE is up 4%, DAX up 3%, Eurostax stocks up 3.4 percent s p futures up four percent uh, but it really was uh, a, t a terrible day for financial markets yesterday um not since 1987 it's 
crazy to see it. It really was history in the making. Um, but again, everything, everything else as well. So this is the MSCI World Index, and it's now trading at more than 20% below its peak, uh, peak to trough. And, I, and this was meant to be the trade this year. You know, global, global growth expectations were meant to rebound this year. Earnings were meant to improve. Um, so imagine how many people were positioned on the flip side of this uh, and how much pain they would be facing uh, now. Um, the Dow, Do Dow Jones Industrial Average, I think a really you know, worthwhile thing of saying uh, is that when people start whipping out uh, the longer term charts, I think that's definitely a sign of caution. Uh, but as you can see, you know, since this, uh, you know, this chart started in nine, 1900s, 1999, uh, you can see that, you know, there has been huge wealth creation. And this is looking at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, but you can see how little this sell off really is um, in the context of things. But I think when people start whipping out longer term charts, that's when, you know, people are really uh, quite scared. And this is a log chart just to let you know. So let's get down into the actual crux of the video. So this actually comes uh, as a result of Goldman, but also Bank of America. So they cut their global growth forecasts, uh, indicating that the bull market is over. Their old 2020 fo fo uh, forecast uh, for global growth was sitting at 2.8% GDP. And now the new one is 2.2%. And they've also outlined their kind of recessionary scenario where glo global growth is actually cut in half. Uh, and this is obviously looking at China. 5.2% was their previous forecast down to 3.2% global growth, ex-China. So that obviously they're factoring in that this, this virus is gonna spread 2.2% uh, uh, down to 0.8%. So Bank of America coming out with some really bearish calls uh, here, revising their forecasts. Um, the S&P 500, uh, as a result uh, of Goldman's call, um, they believe that there's a 15% you know, a downside scenario here. Um, they're signaling and the you know, major strategists came out of Goldman saying that the, the bull market is indeed over. Um, there is a year end target of 11%, but they revise their median midterm forecast down to 24.50. Um, so that's 15 point, uh, percent below uh, where we are at the moment, probably 10% now after, as a result of uh, yesterday's movements, but we are seeing a rebound in S&P futures uh, today up about 4%. Um, but this just shows you how uh, Goldman Sachs and all the big banks are, you know, indicating um, that this bull market is over. Uh, I was listening to Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley, a really good guy uh, to listen to. He's, our, he's the chief equity strategist, so definitely uh, listen to him. Um, he's actually been saying that his equity strategy has been very defensive for the last two years and he's been uh, you know positioned more into those uh, sectors uh, like utilities for example and those defensive tech sectors uh, that i talked about in the previous video uh, but he's been positioning his strategy towards those for the last two years uh, and obviously it's the it seems to be uh, the right call but really we're seeing all sectors uh, kind of sell off at the moment which is uh, you know I think this is a, a function definitely of uh, the behavioral side uh, of financial markets where everyone is just seeing the sensationalist uh, stuff in the media uh, and, the, and the BBC News, for example. You can't turn on the news without seeing it. Uh, and they are just panic selling at the moment. So I think it is, this move is hugely uh, behavioral. Uh, and this chart basically just indicates the, the probability of a recession within 12 months. So these this hopes uh, of a V-shaped recovery have been dashed. Uh, and this is actually as a result of um, previous viruses uh, and the actual rebound, the V-shaped rebound as a result of those viruses. And now it's looking more of a kind of U-shaped, if you want to call it that, a longer term. I think by the summer, uh, we will be looking... Um, you know, more favorable at this situation. Um, but for the, for now, I think in the near term, it is going to get worse um, before it spreads into, you know, it spread obviously into Germany and Italy. Um, I think we are yet to see it really dominate headlines and stuff uh, in the UK and US. And I think there will be some more pain in the short term uh, as of when, when, when we start to see those headlines. Um, but the probability of recession within 12 months has jumped uh, to 55%. Um, as a result of this virus exposing, again, this is the key point, exposing previous weaknesses um, that we've already seen in corporations uh, in the kind of markets. But again, P ratios are still above their historical averages, which is, you know, hard to believe, right? 
uh, even after the drop, the valuation of US stocks remains above the historical average. So you can see it's trading at a, a PE ratio of 16 uh, after the peak of the obviously the dot com bubble. Um, but PEs were, you know, we saw huge multiple expansion last year. And I think obviously, you know, there's been severe compression as a result of the virus exposing these things. Um, but I think, again, from the previous video, the real risk is if, and I think it's inevitable now, if these earnings, so the denominator in this P ratio, start to be revised downwards, then we're gonna see some real carnage in markets. Um, this is a form of relative valuation, so relative uh, rather than an absolute valuation, like a discounted cash flow, um, but it's still above their five and 10 uh, averages, but obviously um, the risk is to the downside, so for, for more multiple compression. And the credit markets uh, are flashing warning signals. So this is a look uh, at the CDX index. So this is essentially an index uh, of credit swap, uh, credit default swaps. Um, so this is a financial swap agreement um, that the seller of the CDS essentially compensates the buyer in the event of a debt uh, default or an adverse credit uh, kind of event. Um, and this is, you know, investors use these for a, multiple, a multitude of purposes. So, for example, speculation. So if you if you see um, that obviously uh, credit markets and corporations like I've been talking about as a result of this financial leverage, um, you know, if you see an opportunity in um, credit defaults or adverse credit events, you know, occurring, then you're going to want to obviously speculate uh, on this kind of CDX index. Um, but this is also used as a hedge uh, for portfolios. You know, you can hedge the underlying bonds in your portfolio if you do see that obviously decline in bond price up in yields, obviously due to this credit deterioration that I obviously um, will look at now and talked about in the previous video. Um, but the, the reason people use these are they are standardized, so they are exchange traded. Um, they're more liquid, more transparent, so you can see the, the CDSs. Uh, CDSs normally trade over the counter, um, so they normally have, uh, you know, they're more specialized. This is more standardized, and you'll tend to see more liquidity in this market, therefore tighter spreads, um, and it is obviously cheaper um, than buying the single CDS and then combining all these, you know, different compartments of the CDX to form this, uh, you know, full index. So this is a, um, the credit markets are flashing warning signs. So we saw um, the spread on US high grade CDS indexes. So the CDX, um, you know, that surged the most since the Lehman crisis all the way up to 130, which obviously is definitely a warning sign. And I think if you look at the credit markets, they are flashing, you know, red. Uh, and this is definitely um, a thing if you're an equity investor um, to be looking at. And this is just really an emphasis of the era uh, of cheap money. And you, this is a long term chart uh, of US interest rates. So you can see uh, they were you know, 6% before the crisis. And obviously, we saw global synchronized easing as a result of that financial crisis them stay on hold until pretty much 2016 and you just see the like magnitude of these little steps 25 basis points 25 basis points and they just completely uh, unraveled all of this um, you know to, to and we are I think now uh, heading to zero definitely uh, like I talked about in the previous video um, heading to zero in US rates but you can see how long this has taken just little steps um, you know, the market's been extremely sensitive um, to any tightening of financial conditions. And now they'll look back, I think, at 2018, Q4 of 2018, at the tightening of that, um, you know, that monetary policy as a huge mistake. Um, but financial markets really force them into that uh, state of, you know, if you tighten, we're going to sell off. And then obviously, the, when equity indices and financial conditions will orga organically tighten when when you see that kind of fear in the market of that selling um, so this is really just an era uh, of this cheap money these low interest rates where corporations have just borrowed and borrowed and borrowed um, you know really with uh, to, f to feed buybacks um, and just to you know expand their businesses um, and lever up um, just really with kind of no, uh, you know, with no fear of um, actually ever, you know, not, I don't want to say paying it back, but without any, uh, with rates actually going up. Um, and you can see this uh, in the debt to EBITDA ratios, and it's the highest in 20 years. Um, so this is just uh, the debt uh, divided by the earnings for interest tax and depreci uh, depreciation and amortization. Um, so this is the debt leverage. So the higher the ratio, the more levered companies are. Um, and the less likely they are be able to cover those interest payments and that debt um, with those earnings 
um, before interest tax and depreciation. So a really worrying metric to look at. Uh, and this is obviously um, the scale of credit uh, quality and credit rating. So I actually used to work for S&P, uh, the world's largest credit rating. So I'm actually going to be biased and look at the credit rating scale from S&P. Um, as you can see, the highest credit quality here uh, is the AAA. Uh, obviously, the lowest level of credit risk, the more likely they are um, to pay back their debt. So the safest investments, if you want to want to call it that. And as you go down to scale, the credit risk of these companies starts to deteriorate. Um, so there's a higher probability of default. Um, so there's a higher credit risk, less likely uh, there will be that these corporations will actually repay their debt. Um, and obviously, you do get a higher yield. And this is why anything below BB minus is called speculative grade, high yield junk. Um, so you do get that higher yield to compensate yourself or any investors for that added risk that you're taking on. Um, so this is the rating scale if you've never seen one before. But what I want to emphasize is there's two trillion uh, in BBB minus debt. Um, so this is the one level uh, or the one notch, uh, if you want to call it that, um, above junk. Um, so this is sitting here in the investment grade setting. Uh, there's two trillion of this debt. Um, there's 600 billion uh, in triple B energy debt. Um, so this is really what I want to stress to you is that corporations have levered up so much in this area of cheap money. There's a real chance now of these credit ratings uh, either dropping or being put on watch negative. So Royal Caribbean was one that S&P put on cre credit watch negative. So this is the probability has increased of them being downgraded uh, to, a, to a later notch. And this is what we call a falling angel. So this is a, a falling angel is uh, one where a corporation falls from investment grade all down to, to high yield or junk. Um, so I think there's a real risk of that now. And this energy debt um, has led the sell off obviously across high yield bonds. The yield to energy has reached its highest level um, since early 2016. Um, and 27 billion of US oil and gas bonds actually come due this year. Um, so as a result of this kind of uh, adverse uh, demand shocks and indeed supply shocks, um, this is going to obviously adversely affect all these corporations, their ability uh, to repay their interest payments and their debt um, as a result of the temp temporary demand shocks impacting their profitability, their revenues. Um, and 27 billion of this oil and gas actually comes due this year. So what's going to happen with that, right? So I think there's a severe risk uh, of these falling angels being, uh, so these investment grade companies sitting in this kind of pocket uh, being downgraded. And Moody's actually have come out um, saying that high yield defaults may rise to 9.7%, so 10% during a worst case scenario. And it's currently sitting at 3.6%. Um, so this is definitely uh, something that I think you will see in the coming weeks or months of these kind of uh, investment grade names sitting on this BBB minus uh, notch falling down to this high yield and junk. And obviously when this happens, this uh, is a really negative signal for equity investors and you'll see very adverse price movements um, in, in, in the share prices of these companies. And you've seen um, some oil names uh, already being put on credit watch negative or downgraded. Um, and this is uh, uh, from my LinkedIn post. So this is my bearish view on financials. So I got asked in the, in the previous video uh, in terms of the UK banks, um, but I think my view is really the same. And this was a LinkedIn post I did, like I said, uh, oil experience a 30% drop down uh, to 30 uh, barrel, uh, $30 a barrel on Monday. And it's actually reported that Bank of America and some other US banks have been hit hard um, and this is coming from data coming from the KBW. Um, so this is data that covers kind of banks um, and they have re significant exposure to the energy sector. So think of banks, obviously, you, you obviously hear about them being investment banks. They're also obviously lending facilities, right? So if you've l lent and a, you know, a huge amount of them have to these energy names that going back to my previous slide, if they're going to be downgraded uh, to credit watch negative or downgraded in terms of into high yield, this is going to put the banks at huge risk, right? They've got huge exposure over 10% to the energy sector. So Deutsche Bank, uh, and so Bank of America obviously was hit quite hard and some of the mid-sized US banks as well. Uh, Deutsche Bank is down 50% in the last month, 30% in the last five days. So Euro stocks, banks index is trading at all time lows. Rates are heading down. There's gonna be suppressed capital markets activity. And what I mean by that is 
the equity capital markets, the debt capital markets of these investment banks, the M&A activity, you know, no one's going to want to deal in this environment. You're not going to want to see, you're not going to want to IPO into this type of environment. Um, and this is something that I actually train on equity capital markets. So um, the kind of the behavioral in instinct of uh, IPOing into this type of environment is going to be something that corporations aren't going to want to do. And I think I saw Airbnb, this was meant to be the big IPO this year. Their bookings have severely, uh, you know, gone down as a result of the kind of travel restric restrictions that, you know, no one's traveling, no one's going to all these, you know, different locations worldwide. And now their IPO is at severe risk. So all these banks are going to be impacted by this suppressed capital markets activity, this reported energy exposure again. And this is kind of another call from Goldman S uh, Sachs saying that they face 34 billion uh, a risk or a European bank faces a risk of that hit. Um, so my actual title of this piece was, you know, when things move quickly, they bend and then they eventually break. So what's going to break? And I think we're seeing some cracks appear now. Um, and I want to kind of on the flip side of this, this is not like the financial crisis. You know, um, this is not uh, that bad yet, um, but definitely something to be looking at. Uh, and I know I'm listening to some, you know, some of the older guys. Uh, I don't want to call them the older guys, but the more experienced guys um, that have seen the financial crisis. And they're saying it doesn't feel like that. Uh, but I think if we do see more downside, I think it could, you know, could definitely uh, spell trouble. And this is just following on the flow of the prob probability of default. Uh, this is a metric you would look at in credit an analytics or credit analysis. So Deutsche Bank's share price, obviously, like we just talked about, you know, down to $4. Um, and their five-year default probability has spiked as a result. Um, so this really is a really nice graphic following on from the previous points that I've mentioned. The one positive for banks... Um, so refinancing, so this is to do with mortgages, for example. So REFI activity was up 480% year on year. So this is uh, coming from the United States. So US mortgage refinancing has surged um, to the most since uh, 2008. And this is as a result of this uh, easing from monetary policy uh, from the banks where they've lowered interest rates. This obviously makes mortgages cheaper but only if you're on a floating rate mortgage, right? If you're on a fixed rate mortgage, this is no good news for you, uh, unfortunately. And there was a stat that 75% of mortgages, I think in the U United States, are on a fixed term mortgage. But I just wanna show you the kind of the impact of this if you do refinance is that you could save about $275 per month on a 30 year loan. And this implies a saving of 3.5 billion a month in payments or 42 billion a year for the US economy, right? So that comes out to 0.2% uh, of US uh, GDP. So I think this is the, the one kind of ball case for the banks is this refining act activity will be up. Um, so 480% year on year, which is quite a considerable number. And there will be buying opportunities. So this is just an insight into some of the levels I'm looking at for JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley, I think for a long-term hold, you know, I don't wanna say that they're gonna be around God, I think people got hit very hard when they said that layman's, you know, is not going to default, is not going to um, not ever be there. Um, but JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley would be my, you know, big bets. Uh, I think from the banking sector, Bank of America as well. And I think $60 and $24 for those shares um, look attractive levels for me for a long term hold. And I actually wrote this, uh, th this slide when I was doing this deck on Thursday. Uh, or Wednesday, uh, and the ECB uh, joins the virus fight. So they've uh, obviously Christine Lagarde uh, had a you know her press conference yesterday, and she actually had a really bad day at the office from uh, from the markets perspective. She said we're not here to close spreads, uh, and then you saw BTPs sell off you know dramatically, um, which was I think a mistake from her. Um, she did look a little bit out of her depth, um, but she has. So they didn't cut the deposit rate um, down to 50, negative 50 basis points in the ECB, but they did uh, provide additional long-term financing and loans uh, for banks to provide this immediate liquidity. And this is something I've been talking about. Um, the key is the, the availability of credit and financing for these small to medium-sized enterprises. And I think this was definitely the right reaction, or this is definitely the right route to go. Cutting interest rates, you know, I don't think anyone's going to care about a 10 basis points cut uh, in the in the ECB interest rate, right? Same with the Federal Reserve. The coronavirus, just because you make money cheaper, isn't going to make people travel, you know, isn't going to provide liquidity to the financial markets um, or to small to, small to medium size enterprises to withstand these temporary demand shocks. Um, they've obviously outlined their more favorable terms um, for the targeted loan 
program uh, and an additional 120 billion euros of asset purchases focused on the private sector. And I actually let, when I wrote this deck, uh, Fed to join, uh, I had a laugh with Will um, that, you know, uh, we saw a big rebound in equity industry futures. Why? Because the, the Fed have actually announced 1.5 tri uh, trillion uh, in repo um, so easing. So this is QE now. I also did um, uh, basically a post months ago that their asset, you know, the balance sheet of the Federal Bank, uh, Federal Reserve has been increasing quite dramatically. And they're calling it not QE. You know, this is definitely QE. So what they've done is essentially provided liquidity to the market. And they've basically allowed for 1.5 trillion uh, in the repo market, three month repo market. Um, so this is going to ease uh, liquidity conditions and financial conditions. And I saw a lot of graphics saying that, um, you know, there was severe uh, stress in the, the treasury market. This is the US treasury market. Um, and I think that's exactly why um, the Federal Reserve have stepped in as a result of that, because this is the US government, right? You know, they have the lowest probability of default out of anyone. So if there is stress in the, the biggest, you know, most liquid market, the treasury market, then the Fed obviously had to step in and provide that liquidity. Um, but they've got a real problem now um, and long term inflation expectations. So this is the market derived inflation expectations. And this is by five year, five year swap. So what's the five year um, what's the five year inflation outlook in five years time? And they've both hit record low. So I think there is that threat. Uh, and this is a call I've been ha having for a while. Um, this threat of J J Japanification, um, the negative interest rates in the US, the interest rate differentials across the world. I think this one was in, uh, inevitable. And I think they've had a real battle with, with stimulating inflation. And now they've got a real risk uh, of disinflation. Uh, so sl slowing inflation and deflation uh, as a result uh, of this action. So the five year, five year swaps, both USD and Europe, um, have hit record lows um, and this is the fed pricing for fed rates and i think it's just unbelievable when you look at this chart and how it's progressed and obviously i look at this quite a lot um, but this is the target rate probabilities um, for the 29th of april so they've got a, the federal reserve have a meeting in march um, and this is the probability for april you know zero percent rates are 50 percent priced in now for april um, from 75 basis points and we hit a high of 225 basis points. It's just unbelievable to see that zero on the chart. I mean, I spoke with Anthony about this. It's just crazy to see. Um, but now the markets are now putting them in this kind of situation where they're going to need to do this because if the market's priced you know, more loosely than the federal funds rate is, then that's going to be an artificial tightening of financial conditions. So this is the same uh, scenario they're in uh, as a result of the previous emergency cut. I wrote that that post saying that um, they have to cut now and cut hard. And I think this was um, the markets putting their, you know, their hand behind their back and forcing them into this. And this is exactly, um, you know, exactly the same. So I'm sure there is some pain in markets, but I think from a portfolio management perspective, I need to go through a th few things of what to do now. And I think the key is don't panic. The mood music is blue right now and you know it is uh, an extremely stressful time if you're an investor or even if you're just a normal uh, individual uh, but focus on the long term but this is obviously um, dependent on your time horizon right so this is some portfolio management kind of things that i i want you to look at and i'm not your financial advisor you should definitely consult them obviously for your own individual condition uh, uh, condition but this is some important factors to consider so you need to assess your time horizon right are you a long term investor? You know, what age are you? What are you investing for? You know, if you are at the end of your retirement, that's going to be, you know, or the, your working life for retirement, that's going to be put you in a, you know, a less um, favorable position uh, for risk assets, right? Because you're going to need that, you know, those funds later, you know, very soon. Whereas a long term investor from uh, the age range of, let's say, 25 to 30, for example, you know, you're not going to need that those funds for for 40, 50 years. Um, so definitely take a look at your time horizon. What are your liquidity needs? You know, what do you need these funds for? What are you investing for? Is it for your kids to go to school? Is it for, you know, almost speculative money just to earn a bit of side income? You need to look at your liquidity needs. What drawdowns are you gonna need for the, for the near term, for the longer term? What's your financial situation? Um, so it, a lot of times it's not your willingness 
to invest or for risk, it's your ability. So you need to look at your financial situation, your salary, your other assets that you have. You know, is it um, is this risk that you should be taking? Uh, or are you, you know, are you looking at your portfolio, your positions every minute? Uh, and chances are, if you're doing that, um, then you're, you've got too much risk on the table. Um, so you definitely look at your financial situation, your psychology. And I think, um, I think it's it, coming from financial media commentators. They're saying, don't panic, don't sell. Um, but really, I know a lot of uh, people have experienced uh, drawdowns in their portfolio um, as all assets have been selling off. Um, and if you are getting to the point where, you know, you just want out, you know, it's too much to handle this kind of negative con connotation, this psychology of this kind of dark cloud can loom over you, over you uh, when you look at your portfolio every day. And it's, you know, there's more and more drowned, uh, you know, uh, drawdowns and you're just seeing it fall and fall and fall. Um, it can be tough to take um, psychologically. Um, you need to assess your investment goals, like I talked about, your risk tolerance, uh, and what assets do you buy next? I mean, uh, I'd say definitely a defensive portfolio is sensible for the, the short term, but like we saw, I think gold fell, and it, what we're seeing is gold take these whi uh, you know, wicked moves downwards, and this is as a result of it being a safe haven status, and it's done very well over the, you know, the last 18 months or so, but people are now experiencing margin calls um, from their equity positions. So they're now selling these gold positions, and this is why you're seeing negative ticks in the, in the gold price, um, where people are covering their margin calls with these winning positions. Um, so definitely re review your asset allocation, uh, both strategic uh, and tactical, tactical being near term, uh, so how you tactically positioning your portfolio and then more strategically for the 20 year, 30 years. But if you just want to think back um, to that Dow chart, I showed you there's been a huge amount of wealth creation uh, you know, over the last hundred years. So in the long term, uh, some of the names, for example, like JP Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley, you, you would expect you know, to, to rebound. And once this virus does pass and it will pass, uh, fingers crossed in you know sooner rather than later we will see a rebound um, so if you've got the stomach you know to put some cash to work now then for the long term and this is not a short term play um, then definitely that would be a sensible thing to do um, but I just want to talk about also the coronavirus and its impact um, obviously Amplify do offer remote training um, both for students if you're a student watching this welcome um, if you're a trader as well, we obviously do offer online programs. Um, so we are moving our summer internship dates uh, online as well. So we're giving you, you the option of remote training. Uh, and what this summer internship training does is it essentially rotates you through all the different roles of finance. So obviously we're talking about global markets now and trading, um, but we also cover uh, things like equity research, universal banking. So looking at credit, m and equity capital markets through our IPO simulation and indeed sales and trading. So if you're looking um, to get experience and let's say your spring week has been cancelled like I've seen a few have or you're not, you haven't got any plans for summer, come and join us either in-house and we do expect the virus to be, uh, you know, the situation to be a lot more favorable then. And I, we've definitely uh, kept that view. Um, but we have also now made the option for you to access it remotely. And we are fully equipped uh, to deal with that remote training. Um, so I remember last Friday, um, Will, our managing director, ran a session for Credit Suisse and Bocconi purely online. So if you're interested in getting that experience, definitely, definitely uh, inquire now on the website. Uh, I'll leave my email address down in the comment section below. Feel free to contact me regarding any of this. Um, if you are uh, a more experienced professional, we do have online options, uh, and this is different to the student side. So if you're a student, definitely, definitely uh, go for the summer internship training program. If you're a, if you're a trader, a seasoned professional, uh, so let's say you've worked in law, oil and gas, or you want to trade your own funds professionally uh, and for you know for a living, we have incredible contact. Uh, content delivered by our directors, uh, expertise and indicators, for example, like I've been through uh, in this session, our directors have a combined financial market experience uh, of analysis and trading of a combined 50 years. So this content is incredible. Uh, it's a rolling subscription of 200 pounds a month. Uh, so definitely take that out and I'll put the link to the trader side um, down there. But again, if you're a student, 
this is more suitable for you. We do cover global markets, asset management, portfolio management, equity capital markets, debt capital markets, M&A, private equity, real estate, uh, technology and finance, so an introduction to algorithmic coding, coding, all the skills necessary for you to land the top role in finance. Um, so definitely check that out. And that is amplifytrading.com forward slash students. I'll leave a link in the comments uh, section. Uh, and for the traders, amplifytrading.com forward slash traders. So like, comment, subscribe, definitely. If you enjoyed this video, it's been a pleasure to, to speak to you today. Turn on your post notifications, subscribe. Let me know what you want to see. Again, like I said, I did action the comments you said, and thank you so much for leaving your comments. There's been su such a positive reaction to the videos. Um, if you want you know, some other video ideas that you want me to do, if you want some stocks on my watch list, like I give you a little insight into JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley earlier, just let me know, leave it in the comments uh, section below. But again, if you've not subscribed to this channel, definitely uh, subscribe. But thank you, good luck with your trading, you know, uh, wash your hands, let's all keep safe, um, but I'll see you uh, next week.